me. How's everyone doing tonight? Fantastic. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Jimmy, uh, and I'm so privileged and honored that I get to be here just as a guest speaker. Uh, and the fact that I get to fellowship and worship and praise and honor our good, good Heavenly Father with this incredible community here. And just a little bit about myself. Uh, my wife and I, Allison Huang, who's st- sitting over there right now, uh, she and I both serve on staff at Mosaic Church uh, over in Winter Garden. However, I am so glad that there is a gospel center community just seven minutes away from my house. That's right. Uh, I live in Mineola, uh, and just seven, living seven, min- seven minutes away, uh, right across the street from Lake Mineola. And I love that beloved church exists. I love that you guys are here. And I genuinely believe that the Spirit of God is present within this incredible community as you seek to be witnesses here in Groveland, Oakland, Mineola, and Claremont as well. And just a little bit about uh, Kevin and I's friendship. Just about uh, less than a year ago, whenever he entered into the pastoral residency program at Mosaic Church, he and I struck up a great friendship, uh, first and foremost, because we were both introverts trying to figure out how to navigate life in this humongous church here. So we clung together and had great talks about scripture and how we were supposed to connect with people as introverts. Uh, But not only that, as I gotten to get to know him when we became good friends, I recognized that he was a man of just extreme godly character. Man, you guys have a tremendously great pastor who is an awesome shepherd for you all. But I also recognize that, man, he didn't need to go through our training process. He was a man who had it all together and who had this incredible vision for this community here in Claremont, where I was struck for the first time when he shared about this direction he wanted to go, that the Spirit of God, I believe, was leading him for a beloved church, a place where people can belong a place where people can be known and be loved. And that stuck with me for the last year as you shared with me the vision and the direction for Beloved Church because I believe that through these values, to belong, to be known, and to be loved, that it will make an impact in our community and in your neighborhoods and in your workplace and wherever it is that God has called you as he's called you and me to be faithful witnesses in our community, which is relevant to what we're going to be jumping in today. I love that beloved church is going through the book of Acts, where in the first chapter, Jesus had called his early followers to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, and that this was ultimately a work of God, that the Spirit of God was leading the early church in the New Testament here to go and be faithful witnesses, because at the end of the day, God was moving mightily. God was moving mightily as the Holy Spirit had descended upon the Jews at the day of Pentecost. But not only that, not only did it end there exclusively with the Israelites, but the Holy Spirit also descended upon the Samaritans as well, half-breeds, Jews and Gentiles as well. But God continued to expand his kingdom to the ends of the earth where just two weeks ago we learned where the Holy Spirit descended upon a Gentile household in the household of Cornelius and descended upon a group of Gentiles validating that the ends of the earth, people from every tongue, tribe, and nation are welcome into the household of God. You and I stand here now because of God's work in sending us his Holy Spirit, validating us that we are a part of God's family. And the gospel will continue to spread as we jump into the text here. This gospel that was hinted at in the Old Testament where, 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 where all these tongue tribes and nations, where God was going to pour out his Holy Spirit on the nations here, that was hinted at in the Old Testament, that was hidden, but yet is now fully revealed. And what God is about to do now, in the text that we're going to be jumping into today, God is about to open the floodgates for the nations, for the Gentiles to be reached so that they can receive the gospel and their lives can be transformed for God's glory and for his honor. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Acts chapter 11. We're going to be jumping into verses 19, and we're going to see how the gospel continues to be carried out to the ends of the earth so that Gentiles, Jews, Samaritans can continue to hear the word of God through faithful witnesses. So God is about to open the floodgates here. Verse 19, chapter 11 in the CSB, that's where we're going to be parked at today. Verse 19, now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far to, as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Like Pastor Kevin mentioned earlier in the call of worship, 
this faithful, devoted follower of God, and Stephen, this one of the first deacons that, that the church, early church had called to serve the, their community, to serve the body of Christ. He was a devoted and follower and faithful follower of Jesus Christ and had this preached the gospel to the Israelites, had preached the gospel to the Jews, and as a result of that, he was stoned and he was martyred by the Jewish leaders. And in that moment, in this tragic moment, the gospel should have stopped right there. The gospel should not have advanced, should not have advanced at all. As people were persecuted and dispersed with the tails between their legs as they ran in fear, but yet God was going to do a mighty thing because of the persecution and martyrdom of Stephen. And as a result of that, people began to scatter, not with their tails between, between their legs, not because they were in fear, but they scattered, taking with them the gospel and spreading this good news of who Jesus Christ was in Phoenicia as they traveled north above to Jerusalem and Sidon and Tyre and even further up to, this, up to the island of Cyprus in the middle of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. They continued because what the enemy desired and meant for evil, God was going to use for good. What the enemy meant for evil, God was going to use for good. And just because this one man was martyred, God was going to use that to continue to open the floodgates for the nations to hear and receive the gospel. And witnesses, faithful followers of Jesus Christ, made their way to the city of Antioch, which is where we're going to be staying at today, where we're going to be unpacking what God did through this incredible community in the church of Antioch here. But the city of Antioch, what we need to understand and know from history was that this was the third largest city in the Roman Empire during this period of time where it was a strategic position, where it was kind of like the capital city of the Syrian province and the Roman Empire during this time. And why it was extremely important here was because there was a mix of both Jews and Gentiles. There's a demographic in this community of both Jews and Gentiles here where they tried to coexist together. However, there was extreme hostility. There was tremendous amounts of tension because the Greeks centuries ago had destroyed the Jewish synagogues. So bottom line, they didn't like each other. These two racial, racial ethnic groups did not like each other whatsoever. And as a result, what we see here in the text is that many of these Jewish Christians only spoke the good news to the Jews. They only spoke the good news to the Jews, possibly because of tension in the history within Antioch. However, the bottom line is what Luke is trying to share with us is that the witness of the gospel was extremely limited to the Gentiles up to this point. However, God, remember, is going to open the floodgates so that the Gentiles in every tongue, tribe, and nation may hear the gospel and receive salvation. And here's what happens next. Because of faithful followers taking Jesus' command seriously to make disciples of all nations. Verse 20, it says, But there were some of them men from Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, also proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. I love that, that there were people who took Jesus' call, people, Jewish Christians from Cyprus and Cyrene who traveled all the way hundreds of miles across sea and across land to go to the city because there were people who were far from Jesus and they needed to hear the gospel, that they took Jesus' words seriously to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as a result of all of that, here's what happened in verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Amen that people came to know the Lord because the Lord's hand was upon them, that salvation belongs to the Lord, that salvation belongs to the Lord, that the Lord's hand, that this was a work of the Holy Spirit, that this was the work of the Lord, and that God had used faithful witnesses to preach the good news of Jesus Christ so that people can be saved, so that they can spend an eternity with their Heavenly Father, so that their hearts of stone could be transformed into a heart of flesh, so that dead people may be made alive. People like you and me who trust in Jesus Christ and who've been transformed by the gospel. This is the good news. This is the good news and the testimony of God 
that he is working mightily and the floodgates are continuing to open more and more as Gentiles continue to hear and receive the good news of who Jesus is. In verse 22, and as a result of that, here's what ends up happening next. This is incredible. News about them, verse 22, news about them reach the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw the grace of God and he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And large numbers of people were added to the Lord. This is incredible that good news, this gospel and this testimony of what the Spirit of God was doing had made its way all the way back to the mother church in Jerusalem and at where the apostles were, and they had to think to themselves, what on earth is happening in the city that we keep hearing about? This is tremendous work. Is this true? As we studied the Old Testament, where it's hinted at that all the nations may be accepted into the family of God, that God was finally going to pour out his spirit to the nations, is this truly happening in the city of Antioch? We need to know. We need to know if this is truly God's work. So they go and send Barnabas, where we learned about a couple weeks ago, where Kevin introduced us in the beginning of Acts, the son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas was all about. The man who is devoted to God, who sold his property in order to care for the needs of the saints, to care for the needs of his brothers and sisters who were in need. And he goes and travels, and he doesn't witness something terrible at all. He doesn't witness Christians and followers of Jesus bickering over one another, bickering over trivial things. No, what he sees is the grace of God present within Antioch. He sees the Holy Spirit moving mightily, taking hearts of stone and turning them into hearts of flesh and making dead people alive. Barnabas witness, witnesses that. And he continues to encourage this church and continues to teach them and to strengthen his church. And as a result, as a result, many people were added to the Lord because Barnabas took Jesus' word seriously to be witnesses all the way to the ends of the earth. And God is going to continue to open the floodgates even further by this next move that Barnabas does. Here's what happens next in verse 25. Then he, Barnabas, went to Tarsus to search for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Saul, the persecutor of the church, the man who was there and present whenever Stephen was stoned, the man who had traveled all the way to Damascus in order to receive a warrant, in order to continue to persecute the church. And by the grace of God, Jesus appears to him blinds him, knocks him down and humbles him. And he tells Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus was going to do more of an incredible work as he calls Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles, where Jesus told Ananias the prophet, the man who cared for him, who revitalized his sight, that says he is the instrument in order for God to reach the Gentiles and to reach the ends of the earth. He is the man who will know what it means to suffer for my namesake. A man who was shipwrecked, a man who was imprisoned, a man who stood on trial for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ because he took Jesus' words seriously. The perfect candidate for someone to lead this church here in Antioch, full of Gentiles. Paul was a perfect candidate, the apostle of the Gentiles who understood Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. He was the perfect candidate to lead this new infant church that God is continuing to build. And for a whole year, in verse 26, they met with the church and taught large numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. I love this, because prior to Antioch and all this happening here, the followers of Jesus were just called people of the way. This ragtag group of people in the Middle East dispersed everywhere who were considered ragdolls of the Middle East because they get beat up all the time. 
they're now finally called something, Christians. And what does that mean today? Because there's much confusion as to what does it mean to be a Christian, especially here in Orlando, where we're one of the most de-churched and unchurched cities here in all of North America, where people, have a, people are just confused as what does it mean to be a Christian? When, they, when, people, when we look at research and just say, hey, Christians are those hypocrites. How many of you guys have ever gotten that before? Here's the deal. What it means to be a Christian, what it means to be someone who's a follower of the way can be found in verse 24. It can be found in verse 24. It's not someone who votes a certain way. It's not someone who just puts a bumper sticker in the back, in the back of their car and therefore we're automatically Christians. And it's easy to give the quick Sunday school answer. It says, what does it mean to be a Christian? It's to be like Jesus. And that's absolutely true. But in a tangible way in verse 24, we get this man named Barnabas who the author Luke describes him as this. What does it look like to be a Christian? What, is it, what are the marks of being a follower of Jesus? Here's what Luke describes Barnabas. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Barnabas was a good man. Not because he was perfect. Lord knows I'm not perfect because he, we're human beings and we're not perfect. But he was a man full of the Holy Spirit and who trusted in God for all circumstances. He trusted in God for his salvation, that he recognized his need for the Lord. And as a result, the Spirit of God lived within him in order to work out his plan for salvation. That is why he was a good man, because he was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. That is what it means to be a Christian. That is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, someone who's devoted to God, who has tremendous faith, and who has the Spirit of God living within inside of them. And what does it look like to live out this name that we've been given as Christians? 2,000 years later, how is it that you and I are called to live out the gospel in a manner worthy of Jesus' namesake? In verse 27, we're going to see how these Christians in Antioch responded to this call to action. In those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world, and this took place during the reign of Claudius. There were hardships coming throughout the Roman world during this time, and these Jewish prophets from Jewish Christian prophets from Jerusalem came down and traveled all the way up to Antioch. And their role as Christian prophets is to edify the church and to build up the church and to speak truth on behalf of the Holy Spirit that was revealed and given to them. However, they had some harsh news to give to the community there, that there were severe hardships, that there was a famine that was going to sweep across the Roman Empire. And as a result, our family members were in need. Our family members, our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem and Judea, they're going to be in tremendous need. You and I may face hardships. You and, I, you and I may be dealing with hardships right now. And especially in Orlando, where hurricanes may strike and trees may fall down, where we may lose our jobs, or where we may lose a loved one. What do we need most in those situations? What do we need most in those circumstances? We need our brothers and sisters to be there for us. We need help. But yet, as Christians, how are we supposed to respond whenever our brothers and sisters and our family members are in need? Here's how the church in Antioch responded. Here's what it looks like to live out our name as followers of Jesus Christ. In verse 29, each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. And they did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. This is how you and I are called to respond when our family members are in need. That they sent to the Jerusalem church, hundreds of miles away, their best. They gave them a relief offering and they gave them Saul and Barnabas. This is what it looks like 
to be the community of God. And as a result, this is what it practically looks like to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth by showing love to our community. So that whenever outsiders look in and think, look at beloved church, and they look at Mosaic church, and they think to themselves, why do these people act the way they do? Why do these people live the way that they live? Why would they sacrificially serve one another, turn the other cheek, put other people's needs above their own? And it harkens back to what Jesus said, that they will know you are Christians by your love for one another. I believe in beloved church. I believe in this community here. That in Groveland, that in Oakland, that in Mineola and Claremont, that this people group right here can make an impact in this community for the sake of the gospel. Wherever it is that God has called you, you can serve this community and make an impact and be witnesses here for the sake of the gospel and for God's glory by the way that you love one another and by the way that you love them. God is going to continue to open the floodgates. The spirit of God is going to be moving. Who can stand in God's way? God is moving. He's going to continue to work so that every tongue, tribe, and nation may bow at the feet of Jesus for his glory and for his honor. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you so much, God, for beloved church, that there's a gospel-centered community here, God, that is preaching God's word, that is making an impact in their community, Father. And I pray that beloved church will rise up to be the new Antioch, to be the new Christian outreach so that the ends of the earth may hear and receive the good news of who Jesus is. Father, thank you for this privilege and this honor to unpack God's word with you. That these people endured, Lord, just the heat here. That they seek to still meet, not neglecting to gather together as some do, but we're here to worship you and praise you. God, we love you. Thank you so much for your gospel. God, as we enter into worship today, prepare our hearts, our minds, our ears to respond to you in a way that you deserve. God, we ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.